Today's guest is Ivy Zellman, CEO of the highly esteemed Zellman and Associates, truly one of the foremost and most prestigious housing market analysis firms in the US. And now it's a sincere pleasure to welcome Ivy Zellman to this webinar. Hello, Ivy. Where are you joining us from? Hi, I'm in uh, New York today. Okay. So for those that might not, might not know you, uh, what is Zellman Associates? How long has it been around and why did you start it? Well, Zellman Associates in October will celebrate its 15th year um, in inception. And I had worked at the Bulge Bracket uh, Credit Suisse prior to starting my own firm and before that Solomon Brothers. And I wanted to take the entrepreneurial plunge and hang my shingle um, on my own. And I felt as if after you know, the majority of my career building what was really a phenomenal Rolodex of C-suite executives that really help inform our research, as well as broadening out my research beyond just home building and building products to other segments of the housing ecosystem that um, I wasn't able to do because analysts at the larger firms were already covering those spaces. So I decided to hang my own shingle. And uh, recently in July of 2021, I did sell a majority stake to Walker Dunlop, who's um, now a publicly traded company that's a predominantly a commercial lender and debt placement, um, as well as investment sales operator. So uh, we're part of a larger entity again. Super interesting and very cool journey, I must say. Thank you. So uh, this webinar is about the U.S. housing market, the topic that you're an expert in. So how let's let's start with the very basics that some of us might not know over in Europe, for example. So how big is the U.S. market and how is it divided? Well, the overall housing market, when we think about households in the United States, there's about 130 million households. And when you think about the you know, uh, delineation of types of housing, the majority is single family, I'd say about 70%. And right now we have a significant amount of multifamily as well as single family construction in backlog um, that in the multifamily segment has been on a tear and is at the highest level since really the early 70s. Uh, whereas single family has also increased tremendously. And when I say backlog, these are homes that have been started, units that have been started, but yet to be completed is back to the highest level since November of 06. So we have a lot of construction in, pro in process, but not a lot of completions at this point. Okay. And how has the U.S. housing market been performing over the last decade, and especially during the pandemic? Well, the overall housing market recovery from the great financial crisis was somewhat slow and, and tepid early on, while the U.S. economy bottomed in, in 09 and we saw recovery in 10 and 11. It wasn't really until 2012 and 13 that we started seeing a real true pickup in overall activity and housing starts were up like 25% in 2012, but we then hit a, a roadblock in 13. So it was a bit of a fit and start. Uh, you know, we had um, markets that were doing better than others. Re really entry level was slower to start the cycle in its recovery. And a lot of that was because builders were just not willing to build further out in the extremely suburban markets. So the best you know, lots in the closest locations were doing more favorably. But in 2016, uh, the builders determined that it was time to you know, build more affordable products and they sprawled out into what we think of the third tier ring and uh, the market took off. And it was about at that time that uh, we started seeing some slowing in the high-end luxury market. So we called that a sort of a tale of two markets that was actually continuing all the way through um, 19 when we started to see a little bit of improvement and move up in luxury. But generally it was, it was rather benign, somewhat lackluster, and we referred to it as tale of two markets. But when COVID hit um, and the market initially shut down, um, housing fell dramatically for a month or two while the economy was shut. But then early May of 20, housing started really becoming um, incredibly robust. We were surprised on the pickup in activity, but consumers, homeowners were, were searching for safety 
and space and distance from urban cities, especially when crime rates were rising. So we saw a tremendous upward trajectory that for the past two years has just been almost, you know, bonkers, you know, robust, um, euphoric, any way you want to slice it, the market um, skyrocketed, frankly, and we've seen, um, you know, price appreciation, you know, stacking on a two year basis where we are approaching more than 30% home price in inflation in two years, and in some cities annualized at 30 plus percent home price inflation. So it's been it's been crazy strong. This in uh, single family homes, multifamily homes and all around the country, or is it concentrated these increases in just particular categories? Actually, it's very robust across all asset classes, um, predominantly the suburban markets for multifamily as well as single family. And that would include single family rental, where the urban lagged uh, initially in the pandemic. We saw multifamily, which is predominantly rental, very little you know, in the US as a percent of the total is actually condominium, but it's um, really the rental market in the cities uh, were negatively impacted because of COVID and people again fleeing for more uh, space and, and distance and safety with crime rates rising. But that has since turned and we're seeing very strong rent performance in the cities. Um, I would say a lot of the um, activity in single family in suburbia is really a, a combination of not only occupants that are looking for, let's say a better home to take advantage of what was very low rates but they might retain their existing home and have what we call a co-primary home. And so if they have a home, let's say in the tri-state area um, in the New York region, they might buy a home in Florida and now have two homes where they can uh, spend, you know, either the majority of their time at that home, but still retain a home. So we have a lot of dual property owners or even dual just occupants that are renting while they're waiting for a home to be built or they're determining that they want to be in a rental and then maybe they'll rent that out when they no longer want it. So there's a, quite a bit of, of that um, number of households that are taking advantage of what was a very attractive low rate environment that has since changed dramatically. Okay. And we will get into that rate uh, adjustment, adjustment and its effects later on. But how is the market doing today, Ivy? The market today is still very um, strong. I think the on the on the margin we're seeing moderation, and we've seen moderation that really started in 21 for primary buyers, where they had been really the predominant um, leader in in acquiring homes. As we started seeing in 2020 to 21, that phenomena. In 21, we started seeing more non-primary buyers enter the market, non-primary including private investors, institutional investors, and second home buyers. And so when you look at the level of activity today incrementally, we believe that 2021's increase in existing home sales, which was actually um, a very strong 9% increase, could be explained 100% by non-primary incremental buyers versus primary, which has been moderating. And that's really a function of a very tight market where primary buyers are having difficulty competing with cash buyers because we're seeing a significant amount of cash buyers that are coming in the market and, and they're much more uh, uh, able to, to compete and, and therefore primary has been losing out. Okay. And just for clarification, because we have a global audience who, whose first language is in English, a primary buyer, what is, what is a primary buyer and what is a non-primary buyer? So a primary buyer is someone who's going to live there full time. It's their home and um, a non-primary would assumingly not. So it could be, you know, an investor that is looking to rent those homes out to create a supplemental income. Uh, many people buy homes just to Airbnb them. Others are looking for, you know, a complete investment property that they'll rent out to, you know, a complete on an annualized basis, another uh, occupant. And institutional investors have been very active in acquiring single family homes to also rent out and have created large business platforms uh, that has been a successful strategy. And then we also have investors that are 
part of non-primary that are pursuing a build for rent strategy, meaning building new construction purposely built for rent. Uh, we also have what we call fix and flip, uh, uh, a fix and flip. So taking a home that is in need of significant repair that likely a primary buyer, especially a first time buyer couldn't afford to fix up. And in that um, opportunity for an investor to fix it and remodel it and then sell it at a higher price. So there's you know, more of that happening in the market, especially with the age of the stock that's now approaching 50 years old. Um, obviously West Coast and south of the Mason Dixon line is younger, but you have, you know, in the Northeast homes that are averaging more than 60 years old. So there's a lot of need for repair. So that's really like the buckets of what's considered non-primary. And I've seen your market reports. They are extremely impressive and extremely in-depth. And I recommend that anyone that is interested in the U.S. housing market to certainly subscribe to them. Um, Thank you. But I'd like to know what are your what are the most important factors to track for the U.S. housing market? Well, it's uh, kind of, there. There's just a number of variables that we have to watch. You know, currently we're very focused on the velocity of how quickly homes are turning in the existing home market, which is the lion's share of the U.S. stock. Um, you know, the new home market is in the call it 15 to 20% range of transactions. And so really the lion's share is existing home sales. So if we start there, we're looking at the level of inventory, but more importantly, how quickly is it turning? So if we were to say at the end of a 30 day period, let's say the end of this month, how many homes are listed for sale? And then subsequently, how many sell within that 30 day period would be the de definition of velocity. And prior to COVID, 20 to 25% would sell in that 30 day period. And right now that velocity peaked last month prior to the rate surge at almost 60%. So we're watching to see how quickly those homes uh, remain um, at that level of velocity. And that's an important variable. We're of course looking at new listings coming to market um, to see if there's more sellers that are getting nervous and trying to take advantage of the significant appreciation in the market, you know, for, from the period from start of COVID through really currently, there's been in total for homeowners, 5 trillion of wealth creation. So a lot of people have made a tremendous amount of money in their homes. So do sellers start getting nervous and start saying, you know, it's time to sell the, the chicken, and the egg has been, well, where are they going? in a very tight market. And that's really national. It's not just one market in the United States. The, the market has been extremely tight. And again, a lot of that being driven by these dual occupants, non-primary. So we're watching to see um, you know, overall buyer interest, buyer appetite. We do surveys. So every month we're conducting surveys of very large sample sizes for real estate brokers, home builders, land developers, building product manufacturers, distributors, every part of the ecosystem, uh, the rental market, both F multifamily, single family rental. And that enables us to understand what we're seeing are, are cancellation rates rising for those people that had already signed a contract and backlog. Are we seeing people having difficulty getting mortgage approval now? So it, it's a long list, frankly, of things that we're watching. But I think that, you know, our view is how many new orders are, are being signed, how many pending contracts are being signed in the existing market. Um, so at this point, I'd say that, um, you know, the most thing I'm focused on, and there's many variables, but very, very focused on what's happening with respect to new orders and what's happening on cancellations, if, if we're seeing any. And, and one last thing, builders have been speculating. A lot of builders have... Um, multifamily is all speculative because they build the, the complete, you know, multifamily dwelling and then they lease up. But in the new home market, typically a buyer will order a home, um, sign a contract, and then in some cases customize it. And if it's entry level, they might not have much choice, but they, what they call is a, a pre-sell. And because of the cost inflation in building products and labor, there has been um, a squeeze on builders 
because by the time with cycle times being so extended, by the time they actually delivered that home, their margins would be much lower than when they actually sold the home. So many of them are waiting closer to completion to release the home. So we're seeing a lot more speculative units that are in backlog because of that phenomena than we would have normally. So we're seeing what happens with those specs and will builders be forced to reduce price on those specs or just have you know, more pricing pressure as affordability has become quite stretched because of the rate surge that we've seen. One thing which we often read about here in the news in Europe is are the housing starts in the US. How important are they on a monthly basis for the housing market? Well, I mean, it's an indication of what the activity is. So we just had, you know, housing starts reported yesterday and, you know, we're running at about a million six annually. And what we have in backlog is evenly split between single family and multifamily. But I think that the, you know, month, month to month while volatile and previous months are restated, I think directionally, it, it really gives you a benchmark to go off of, of what supply is coming. And right now, the biggest bottleneck is not so much what is being started because the actually starts are under pressure because there's less being started because there's so much in backlog that they can't even get those homes completed. And cycle times have been extended by as much as two months more than normal. So I think that there's a focus on completions rather than just starting more because of, again, you know, concerned about the cost inflation. And I think builders are being a little bit more conservative now. Okay. And for us in the forestry industry, I've read and heard that around 50% of U.S. lumber consumption goes to single family homes. How has that segment been performing specifically? As I said, the single family market has been, you know, beyond um, robust and the demand is ex- far exceeded supply. And so what you have is, you know, starts as a percent of new orders, which historically you'd like that to be one to one, where for every order you have a housing start. Uh, We're seeing right now starts running at about 116% of orders as builders again have been speculating more than the number of contracts that they've been writing. But I think the single family portion, if you're, you know, um, in the timber business and you're selling lumber to, to builders, you're in a very you know, enviable position because they are in need of the product. While pricing has been very volatile, we all know in terms of lumber, I think that the demand side, because of their backlog being so strong, should allow for completions to continue to grow over the next two plus years. And you also mentioned that the construction starts are pressurized downwards, but how can that be fixed? What are the underlying causes? Well, part of it, as I said, is that they have too much in backlog. So that they're, you know, having municipalities are also causing delays in getting approvals. And that's been due to um, just personnel shortages. And, you know, when you talk to builders, they'll just say they're waiting for approvals or waiting for approvals from their permits and they can't get started without the permits. So at a municipality, like in Phoenix, let's say in Maricopa County, there might've been one, you know, six people that worked at the municipality and right now they're down to one or two people. So there's bottlenecks across all aspects of the food chain. It might be that the communities are not coming online as quickly as you had hoped. And that might be a function of putting uh, roads and sewage in place that are taking longer than expected. So there's a tremendous shortage on trade and, and all aspects of development and is including at the municipality level, which is causing more starts to be delayed, but then the phenomena of what well, we should be focused more on rather than selling, we even have half of our builders are, had been limiting sales within a, in each of their communities because they didn't want to sell more and get too far ahead of themselves because they have customer service issues with the people that are in backlog. Okay, I understand. And talking about the builders, sometimes we read read about builder optimism and lead times and so on. So how is optimism measured and what does that usually say about the market? And are lead times now, how much are 
lead times hampering and how much or rather like this how much more delayed are lead times this year compared to for example last year or pre-covid well it's about two months on average um which has been in the the most extended and that varies from market to market um in terms of the optimism the optimism has been extremely high but now that rates have surged there's been um definitely a more cautious tone and that's due to affordability concerns. So I think that builders are recognizes, recognizing that, you know, the euphoric um, activity is starting to moderate and they're seeing that in some cases by their weekly traffic. Um, there are surveys coming out that buyer optimism is under pressure and falling, especially primary buyers, as I mentioned. I've spoken with builders that are seeing people that can't get approved now that are in backlog, even though they may have had, you know, already earned quite a bit of equity because the home values have gone up. So there's a nervousness in the market right now, I would say, a, 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 you know, optimistic, but cautious nervousness and, you know, surprisingly still seeing some, depending on location, very strong reception. Um, and that may vary like in Boise where the market was up Idaho was pricing was up more than 70% in two years. And there was a lot of speculation by investors there, as well as primary buyers. The primary buyer can't afford homes there anymore. So now we're starting to see, um, at least within the new home market, builders willing to incentivize and even seeing some price cuts because of rates. Now that's not necessarily every market, but it's so early really to give you a read because rates really didn't even cross 4% on 30 year fixed until the very end of March. And the, the rate surge that we've seen where according to Freddie Mac, 30 year fixed rates are now 5.2%, you know, that that's all occurred assumingly in the last three weeks. So, you know, two weeks even, so it, it's all new. And so the real time vibe is, is admittedly cautious and, and should be. Over 90% of homeowners in the United States actually have a mortgage rate that's locked in below 5%. So 91% of people already are locked in. So you say, well, if I have a 4% rate and 71% of United States homeowners with a mortgage are below 4%. So all of a sudden you say, you know, my rate is not transferable. So I'm not incentivized to move now because I don't want to give up this low cost. And that may be a bottleneck now to really seeing mobility. On the other hand, there are those that have made so much money in a market that's, let's say, you know, a place like Arizona where their home value might have doubled from when, you know, a few years ago. So they could sell it and have a big profit and go to what's a lower cost market, let's say in Houston, where it's much better, more affordable today, or even a bigger example, more extreme example would be, you know, selling in high cost markets like New York or California and going to what is more affordable states with more favorable tax basis. And so the arbitrage is still there. And I think that's offsetting those that are locked in at very low rates that might otherwise be disincentivized and that we continue to watch closely because the mobility of what we're referring to in the US is sort of the great American shuffle, which has been actually occurring for decades where people have been moving from you know, high cost states to low cost states, but that really accelerated during COVID. And we saw a lot more people leaving New York to go to Florida or California to go to Texas and and actually in Texas they now call the Californians Texafornians because there's so many Californians that are now in Texas. So that will be one of the variables that we'll continue to monitor and see if it offsets this surge that we're seeing in rates due to very high inflation. When do you think it will be possible to get a read on the market on the effect of these higher rates? Is it in three months, a year, or? Well, assuming they stay high, you know, there's a lot of people that what is referred to as fence sitters, that there's a sense of urgency to run in now. And that could be historically a few months before 
those fence sitters sort of get resolved. So it's tough to say we're, we're watching more closely because we all also watched rates go from three to four in the beginning of the year and expected the same thing, that things would start to slow and they didn't. They really didn't slow. And it's hard to get a read on the market when builders are limiting sales. So if they're not selling and releasing everything, it's hard to really say, well, how is demand? So with traffic you know, starting to show some moderation and apparently, you know, again, markets seasonally this time of year is spring selling season. We've saw we've seen March typically increase from February more than 20% sequentially in let's say new home orders. And that actually only increased 7%, one of the slowest sequential declines. And so combination of um, month to month surveys that we do really give us the read. We actually have a, a weekly product that we um, have called the Western Market Report that um, aggregates what's happening in new home markets in a number of West Coast markets. And that's been a good leading indicator as well to knowing what the month will look like. And, you know, the, again, seasonally still stronger, but definitely moderating and, and worse than normal seasonality. Okay. And on the topic of affordability, how is it affecting the average American and specifically first time home buyers or first time home renters? Is it causing a delay for a younger, for a younger demographic to move out and have uh, mobility in the market or what could well, be I the effects that, you know, of this? Yeah, I think when you know COVID hit, you know, we typically have had about 2.3 million annually uh, renters convert to home ownership. And that number in the fourth quarter of 20, you know, two quarters into the post-March 20 shutdown, we saw that surge to almost 2.85 million. So it, it surged and renters were taking advantage of, again, what was the lowest rates on record or close to. And then since that time, that primary buyer has been coming back down to the more of the trend line. And I think it's a function, again, of frustration because they can't compete with the cash buyers. But now that affordability has been impacted because of the monthly payment. So we look at, if you think about a primary buyer who's looking to buy the median priced home that's in the, in the mid to high 300,000 range now, and how much if they put down, you know, FHA requires only three and a half percent that you put down if you get an FHA mortgage, what would be the monthly payment as a percent of my gross income? Factoring in, of course, um, you know, principal and interest, but not property taxes and sort of just a snapshot. That has increased in the new home market real time 40% year over year. So that's significant. And I think it is having an impact on their willingness to move forward or ability to move forward. And we'll see where rates stabilize, you know, with the Fed obviously very hawkish now trying to fight inflation. But I think that that affordability is what we would, we, we take that monthly payment as a percent of gross income and we um, index it to 100. And anything above 100 would be considered stretched. And we're right now definitely in stretched territory and we're in the call at 110, 112 and rising. And it's somewhat contingent on where home prices settle out because home prices are still rising or had been rising um, at a double digit pace in 2022 year to date. So you get the double dynamic of rising robust pricing in the face of rising rates. And that's having that profound impact on the monthly payment for those primary buyers. Okay. And two final questions before we enter the Q and open the Q&A for the audience. Uh, what are some of the new building trends that we are seeing or housing market trends that we are seeing or what shifts do you expect to see in the market? Well, I think that the, you know, square footage has been moving down for quite some time, really since 16, where we were seeing more builders willingness to build a more affordable product and those third tier 
um, outer rings in the suburbs. And as that market had um, definitely been strong and robust, we started seeing a lot more uh, technology offerings too. So smart homes where they've got alarms that are, um, you know, security systems put in place that they can use as an app on their apps, on their phone, along with temperature control, putting in Alexa. So the, the smart home technology has been a big part of what millennials are demanding. I think that more open floor plans and, you know, I think today offices, people want to have the ability in some cases, instead of having a den, they might have a spare bedroom and to have two offices, one for the, themselves and their spouse because they're working remote. So I think that's been more important for them too. So the layout on, and how builders are designing the homes, accommodating more of a remote work environment. Um, the, as, as affordability gets stretched, you start to see a shift to more townhome product and you start to see um, less bells and whistles, less options and upgrades as people can you know, still afford, but maybe not as much as they, they could. They'll try to reduce the, the costs by being more prudent about how many upgrades they'll get. So those are some of the things that we're seeing. In multifamily, there's been, um, in the suburban markets, a lot more garden style product being developed. Um, that way people can have maybe more of a, a, a unit that has a green space near it and they prefer preferably over high rises. We've seen um, within the build for rent space, a lot more product that offers the consumer this experience to have the white picket fence, the American dream, but if they can't afford to buy it, they can rent it. And that's been um, probably of all the, you know, residential pieces of the ecosystem, the one where the capital is pursuing it the greatest. And it's very concentrated though. Like in Arizona, that's the number one market. You've got Georgia, the Carolinas and Texas where the predominance of built for rent is the strongest. But I do think that affordability and rents are also stretched because rents have been rising at a double digit pace. Historically rents in single family and in multifamily, you'd be lucky to get two to 4% annual rent uh, increases if you were a landlord. Now we're seeing, you know, blended rent growths that are, you know, trending in the high single to low double digits, depending on the market. So because of constraints on, again, supply and not enough inventory, there's just been affordability challenges, both rental and for sale, which would likely mean one of two things. We could see more people that are staying home with their parents uh, and just can't move out or we can see roommates um, forming as people start to recognize that you know they can't afford it on their own. So really household consolidation is, is at risk. Okay. And the question probably on everybody's tongue is how do you expect the, what is the outlook for single family homes? Do you believe that the construction will remain stable until end of the year? And how will might it look beyond that? Um, we do expect construction to continue because the backlog has got to be delivered. So once builders put the you know capital in the ground, they're going to monetize it. There's a lot of money tied up on the balance sheets of these companies of the dirt that they've acquired and they've been in the developing mode. So the good news is that there's going to be a lot of activity over the next two plus years. The question, the really the lever is what at what price. So I think this turns to less about, you know, housing starts could come under pressure because if the demand starts to weaken, then incremental starts might weaken. Although there's a lot of, again, capital that's already been invested to put in sewage and roads. So once they start development, they'll keep going. And if they have to reduce the price of the new incremental start. So I don't see starts plummeting, but I do think that the lever is more likely to be on price and I do think the activity and backlog is going to push the construction market to um, still have good activity. Again, if the manufacturers, distributors have had very strong pricing power, if the builders are starting to see the need to incentivize pricing pressure, they'll start pushing back to their vendors 
And I think that is a likely phenomena if the housing market does moderate or you know outright weakens as a result of the primary and let's say non-primary buyers are starting to you know pull back because of the higher cost of capital and and just overall um, increases in in rates. Okay, super interesting. We will momentarily be opening up the floor to Q&A. So to the audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A button, which you will see at the bottom of the screen. Please don't submit them in the chat box. Until the questions start coming in, I would like to make another short announcement. So we at CenterSource are today launching a services division which allows cargo inspection at the sawmill or in the port. A second service that we're launching is a shipping document review. So in, if you, in case you're busy, you don't have time to review the documents or uh, staff is sick, our in-house expert will do this for you. And in case you're a sawmill that doesn't like to receive letters of credit and manage them, you can nominate us as the manager and beneficiary for them. And we will, for a very, very small nominal fee, manage the whole process for you from drafting the terms until final remittance. And in case you did like this episode, we do a, a lot of different talks with various types of market leaders and market experts around the world on many different topics. On the screen, you can see some of our previous episodes. And these talks are also available on Spotify. And now it's a sincere pleasure to open up the Q&A. The first question is from 1.6 million starts in 2021. What is your outlook for total US housing starts for 2022 and 2023 and beyond? Do you see any US recession in your outlook? Um, we don't forecast for sessions. That's not our expertise, um, but we do have growth in starts in 22 um, as well as in 23 before seeing starts moderating in 24, so declining. So I think it's more about the backlog that we're focused on, but I think we think that overall activity can get back to 2019 levels. And so looking at how much of the need for supply do we have we believe that we really are about a million three a million four is what would be a sort of a more normalized level of starts and because we don't have the expertise to forecast if the us will have a soft landing or have a hard landing i think we think it more normalizes to those levels and um, that's kind of our longer term outlook because we think otherwise we'll oversupply the market if we continue to build well above that million three million four range. The next question is from Scott. Do we have enough demographic information to know how millennials are reacting to the rise in interest rates and average home pricing? Well, I think that the demographics in the United States has been um, quite sobering. Just looking at population growth has slowed dramatically from prior decades. In 2020, from 10 to 20, population growth grew at only 7.4% for the decade. And that was the second slowest ever on record uh, with birth rates under pressure, immigration under tremendous pressure, as well as higher death rates. Um, obviously COVID, um, even excluding COVID, we think the death rates have been accelerating because of the aging population. So the population itself has been not very favorable. Household growth similarly, actually slowed in the decade to 8.7%. This was the slowest ever on record. And this was really um, more uh, concentrated. It's, a, it's across the country, everything's moderating, but some states are moderating from a very high level. Let's say a Texas household growth might be have gone from 22% to 20, but it's all moderating. So I think when we look at the millennials, you know, the oldest millennials today are in their um, like 40, 40s. So many of those people have already bought a home. So incrementally, the, the way you get, you know, the younger millennials to incrementally buy is if they are leaving mom and dads. So we, we track the number of people living 
with their families at between the ages of 20 and 39. And that those numbers have been up until recently because of COVID, they had been continuing to rise surprisingly. And we're not sure, you know, quite puzzled, frankly, but that those numbers have come back down, but they're still above 2019 levels. So I think millennials um, want to buy. The question is, can they afford to buy? If we were building product that was truly affordable, I think we'd see more of those people leaving their parents and going out on their own. Is there any statistic available that points how many 18 and uh, older, uh, maybe between eight, eight ages 18 and 30, are still living at home with their parents? Well, we do show, we look at 20 to 39 year olds. And so the data that we showed at the end of 2020 um, was surprisingly up from 2010 uh, at, and it was about 23.7%. And what we expected, because in 2000, it was 16.4. And so when we got to 2010, we really weren't surprised to see that at 19.7% because of the GFC. And, and a lot of young adults had no choice as they were unemployed to stay living with their parents. But at the end of 2020, to see it rise to 23.7 was somewhat surprising because we have a stronger economy. As I mentioned, the 23.7 has since come back down to where it was in 19, but it was still above 20% in 19. So we're, we're watching that. Um, and the decennial survey is a 100% sample size. So when you had COVID counting in March, uh, they do it March sort of year end on a on annual or a decade basis, they do it annually as well as of March 31st. Um, so there might be improvement because the data we have is a little stale. But I would say that the, you know, numbers are still elevated and that we think about that really a function of maybe the stigma of living at home is not so bad. You know, there's more households in other countries, developed countries like in Europe where there's multi-generational living and maybe it's kids are, you know, more kids are going to college and staying, you know, going for higher education, not yet married, delaying marriage, trying to understand it um, because it's quite puzzling other than affordability issues. Okay. The next question is from Krister. That question reads the following. How about, how is the overall economic situation in the U.S.? Well, I'm not an economist, so I don't know that I can give a, a broad answer, but I know that with the Fed now concerned about inflation, you know, we, we are running hot right now in the U.S. There's, you know, no question there's been labor shortages. And despite the fact that there's still, you know, 10, 11 million job openings, there's really a reluctance to get people come back to work and the participation rate has been improving, but it's been a challenge and we're seeing very strong, um, you know, pricing in, in the CPI um, indexes. So that's concerning to the Fed. So they're now really trying to cool things off a bit and maybe we'll start seeing some of that as supply chain bottlenecks have been obviously magnified because of COVID. And so the idea was it was transitory and that we were gonna see inflation abate, but I think there's very strong inflation across all aspects of the economy. So that is creating a lot of uncertainty about whether the Fed can, as people call it, thread the needle and provide the US a cooling without causing it to go into recession. Okay. The next question is from Matt. Uh, Ivy, thanks for generous, generously sharing. What percentage of new home sales are built as investors? Um, well, most builders that are speculating, they won't know who, who the purchaser of those homes are, but I would say that our surveys um, would say that right now, non-primary, is about 15 to 20%. And that it would again include that private investor, second home buyer, and the actual numbers for the United States that we aggregate in 2021 was 25% of all transactions were non-primary. And that was up from 2020 at 20%. So it's expanded rapidly. And you know, I would say that it's probably under stating to some extent, because not everyone is forthcoming 
that it is an investment property, especially if they're paying cash. Okay. The next question is from Bryant. A few weeks ago, a few weeks back, there was a piece on 60 Minutes stating that the U.S. has some 4 million homes short of supply. Can you speak to this and what period do you think applies? Well, I watched the 60 minute episode as well. We, we've been contrarians on that um, view. So most forecasters from the NAR, Freddie Mac, FEA, they're all expressing that there's a huge deficit of four to 6 million or even higher units in the United States. And we believe that that's grossly um, overstated in terms of the deficit. We think we're more in balance when we look at true households, plus what we would argue with the other aspects of demand. So you have households plus whatever gets demolished, you need to replace that. And then there's a level of what we call excess vacancy. So we think we're building right now, what has been started is running right about where it should be. But what's being completed is, I'm, I'm sorry, what's being completed is probably at the normalized level. Um, we don't understand their methodologies as to why they're saying we're severely underbuilt, but we believe a lot of the cloudiness has to do with this non-primary piece that is not part of what would be viewed to be normalized demand. We do incorporate in that normalized demand number an aspect of what's what we call excess vacancy, which incorporates some non-primary second home predominantly, but those numbers are so inflated right now that that creates this tightness and view that we're so short. And some people start counting, well, we underbuilt starting in 2000, you know, seven, eight, nine. And you just say, well, when, you know, first of all, what, what, what would happen if you started counting in 2002? And then therefore we overbuilt during the, the boom cycle, or what are you using for your normalized level of household formation? Because many people just use a million five and assume that that number is the same number and it hasn't changed, where our demographic work has showed that that number has been under pressure um, really for the last several decades. So our methodology shows that we're more in balance today and that we believe that we are at risk of overbuilding if we continue to you know, see the level of uh, starts and what's coming in backlog. And that actually takes us into the next question from David. What is your outlook for household formation? We have a continued deceleration. So we're expecting population growth in the 20 to 2030 um, timeframe to decelerate to 4% and household growth to slow to, I believe, 7.9%. So we expect the trends that we've been seeing to not reverse. And that's really a function of you know, continued pressure on all the aspects of, of population, the three things that we're seeing, their fertility rates, not really expecting that to turn around as it's been under pressure for quite some time, really, since 2007, I believe. And the immigration is one of the positive opportunities for the U.S. government to show a more favorable stance towards immigration. That could change the forecast dramatically. Um, but in terms of death rates, we're not assuming extrapolating from COVID and, and assuming more people die from COVID. We're just kind of using a normalized trend line there. So our outlook is, again, a little bit more sober on the demographics. And by the way, the U.S. is probably the tallest midget in developed countries because this is very similar around the, the globe, frankly, where we're seeing slowing demographics. The next question leads as follows. What are the top two or three metro, metro areas to consider that are the most active in housing construction in the coming five years? Well, I think that today it's tough to say beyond two to three years what will be the strongest, but there's no question that um, the Southwest is the strongest part of the country. Um, Arizona, as well as the Texas markets have been extremely robust. And, and a part of that too is the building um, constraints are not as prevalent in those markets. Um, there are mountain states, whether it's you know Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, have done extremely well and have benefited again from this great American shuffle. The state of Florida is probably the number one state in terms of home price appreciation and total. 
as well as just you know significant level of incremental demand driving more construction in throughout the state in southwest and south East Florida, there's more constraints on development, but throughout the central part of the state and Tampa, Jacksonville, Orlando, we're seeing a lot of construction and, and, and had been very, very strong demand. And again, we'll, we'll see what happens. So Carolinas have been very strong. It's really, we refer to the strongest markets as the smile states or the sand states, which is the same states that did extremely well in the great financial boom. But right now the good news for the US um, housing market is because of all the equity uh, wealth creation, as I mentioned, 5 trillion, we have more skin in the game and there's not as many people that are just gonna hand back their keys and walk away. So we're not worried about a severe downturn, but we do see a higher concentration of developing um, construction, new, new construction in these smile states than we do in let's say the Midwest or the Northeast where it's you know, not as desirable, but still growing, but just not growing at the same rate. And we have three last questions. You actually are, you're a very popular speaker, Ivy. That's, <laughs> that deserves a medal in itself. Oh, thank you. Usually we don't get this many questions. So the last three, the next question leads as follows. How is the DIY sector in the US after the pandemic? It seems to be slowing down since people are not as interested in spending on their home anymore. We actually just published our home center survey. So we're aggregating more than 150 billion in revenue from manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. And that allows us to have a pulse on all aspects of the, the building product market, including DIY. And we definitely have seen uh, moderation weakening activity through the first quarter, um, really into April as well, more so. Uh, March was weaker than February. We think comps year over year will be down in mid single digits for the home centers. Um, that being, you know, really a function of tough comparisons because the anniversary in April, the strength that we saw last year, it was continuing to be very robust, as well as the stimulus that the US pumped into the economy. You know, people were, you know, benefiting from stimulus checks, excess unemployment, child care tax credits, not paying rent, not paying their mortgage and they were stuck at home, so they were spending more money on their home. But those are unlikely to be recurring because after you've done all the honey to-do list and there's nothing left to do on the to-do list, plus you're doing all things now, traveling again. The US is no longer even requiring masks in airports. People are going back out and doing things and going back to the office, although that's still a slower return. So all of those things I think are resulting in less focus on the home or maybe arguably the benefits of all the incremental liquidity pumped into the economy are, are now diminishing. And that is also having an impact. The next question is from Remco. We hear about shortages of truck, truck drivers in the US. Is there also a shortage of construction workers and can, and can this be one of the causes for delays in homes getting finished? Definitely uh, labor shortages have been um, part of the challenges for builders. I think that many of the trades are um, were, were reluctant during uh, the period post the great financial crisis to really staff up. As I mentioned, the, the housing market was slower to really come out of the GFC relative to the other parts of the economy. And the industry in 16, 17, when we started seeing really that, that inclination to build a more affordable product, we ran into labor shortages then because we, we, we have what's e-verification on job sites. So without immigrants, which used to be in some markets, half of the trades, um, they're now you know, getting um, deported. So you're seeing very few willing to work in construction because of you know, inspectors coming on job sites. And we also have an aging problem. So HVAC, for example, the average uh, worker in HVAC is 55 years old. And whether you're talking plumbers or roofers, they have had a harder time recruiting and replacing a lot of those that are aging out. So that's put shortages in place. And it's a question of, are they willing to invest and really grow their platform and try to recruit and hire? And I think some of them are somewhat reluctant to do so recognizing that we're at a very high level of, of activity and, and maybe the market is cyclically peaking. 
Um, so it is part of it. Some builders have the larger scale builders that provide continuity to trades and pay them regularly on time. And they might be outperforming a smaller or maybe less favorable relationship. So, you know, there's many products that are on allocation. So it's not just labor, but labor is one of the headaches. And, and you know, I'd say it's probably at higher on the list than you would expect. But at this point, uh, we would imagine that starts to alleviate itself if we are seeing more slow activity. The other aspect too, is many developers or um, project managers, superintendents are being poached by build for rent operators um, that are offering trades, the ability to build whole communities and not have to interact with a customer, which is kind of nice for them. And they could just um, have the whole project so there's been a lot of um, movement on the chessboard of these of these vendors and trades too that we're seeing in the marketplace right now. Super interesting dynamics. I think none of us actually uh, knew about, or if we had even read about them in the news, it, we certainly didn't understand the uh, details about it. And the last question for you, Ivy, today is from Johanna, who I remember was the first person to say in the chat that she's watching from Finland. In oh. Europe, her question reads as follows. In Europe, there has been more or less a eco trend for some time now. Wood construction is booming, not only in single family homes, but also in big projects and public buildings. Are you seeing anything similar in the US? Um, definitely more focus on, you know, eco friendly and doing what they can to, um, you know, preserve energy and be more environmentally focused. But I don't know that we've seen a sea change as much as we recognize that there's um, what is termed in the US ESG, which is um, an acronym environmentally, oh, I don't know what just happened, environmentally sovereign, I lost you, <laughs> governance. That is a acronym that public companies are measured by. And if you're a publicly traded home builder or a building product manufacturer, the Wall Street you know, institutional investor wants you to be environmentally focused. So we're seeing more of an, an effort, whether it's in solar, whether it's providing eco-friendly products, but I don't see a sea change that I can say, wow, you know, the, the market has completely changed direction. And, and we know that there's you know, a lot of what we'd call dinosaurs in our industry that you know, typically are very slow to change, but there is more momentum in that direction. Ivy, I'd like, I'd like to sincerely thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your in-depth knowledge. And here on the screen, you can see Ivy's contact details and her company's website, where you can actually request access to uh, the company's market reports, which are extremely in-depth and which I highly recommend. Ivy, thank you so much for yeah. coming today. And thank you also to the audience for watching as well.